Hello, and welcome to the next in a series of podcasts from the Southeast Comprehensive Center. The SECC works closely with the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina to provide access to information, models, and materials that facilitate implementation of and compliance with NCLB. We build the capacities of states to implement the programs and goals of the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001. The following podcast was recorded live at the November 5th through 7th, 2008 Southeast Comprehensive Center, English as a Second Language Institute. Jazzing it up, a medley of notes for creating a culture that supports English language learners. Dr. Robin Scarcella is a professor at the University of California at Irvine, where she also serves as the director of the program in Academic English and ESL. Dr. Scarcella has written over 60 scholarly publications on ESL teaching and L2 acquisition, edited numerous volumes, and written many methodology books and textbooks. Since 2004, she has provided professional development workshops to over 10,000 elementary and secondary teachers. Her most recent volume is Accelerating Academic English. Dr. Scarcella also has written over 20 articles on ESL teaching and L2 acquisition, edited three volumes, and written one book. Her articles have appeared in such journals as the TESOL Quarterly, Language Learning, as well as Brain and Language and Second Language Research. In addition, she has been a guest lecturer at more than 20 institutes and universities, including the Center for Applied Linguistics, the Foreign Language Institute, Stanford University, and the University of Hawaii. She received a doctoral degree in linguistics at the University of Southern California and a master's degree in second language acquisition education from Stanford University. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today, and I thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it is true that California is in a state of crisis. The nation is having a, a educa uh, an economic downturn, we might say. Uh, a lot of st I'm talking to a lot of educators who are working with homeless children. Our English learners will be suffering, and even some of us and our teachers are, so it's just something to, to keep your eyes open to. But we are now entering a new era of hope and challenge. I am the director of a program in academic English, and I frequently have students who bring me essays that look just like this one. It hasn't changed over the years. This is a student who has lived in the United States for many, many years, came in at age five, and she brought to me in my office stacks of her high school English work, and she tried to convince me that she didn't need to take one of my English as a Second Language courses, crying as she spoke. And I ended up putting her in the course, and you can see, she says, I really not need Humanity 20 writing class, because since time I come to the United States, all my friends speak language. Until now, everyone understands me, and I don't need study language. I don't know Vietnam language. I speak only English. I have no communication problem, and with my friend in dorm, so she speaks English. My English teacher in high school, key person to teach me. My teacher explained to me that how important the book was for the student and persuaded me to read many books. I get A in English throughout high school, and I never take ESL. I agree that some student need class, but you has not made a correct decision put me in English class. Please do not make me lose the face. I have confidence in English. I showed this letter to a, a professor. I won't mention where he came from, UC Berkeley. And he told me that this was excellent writing, that it was very coherent, and that it certainly was cogent. You know, she makes a strong argument. You know, what's the problem? And I said, well, would you like your daughter to write like this when she comes to the university? And he said, well, no, not my daughter. And I just felt, you know, how dare you? Not my daughter, but my students. And my students are much more likely to face linguistic discrimination. So I put the student in the class. And, and I should tell you uh, a little history about her. Um, she went through our schools, and basically she was ignored. She worked really, really hard. She's very diligent. She was everything you talked about earlier, the stereotypes about the English learners, just a really nice person. And everybody probably found her very, very nice, but nobody gave her 
rigorous instruction or held her to high standards. Nobody told her she hadn't acquired academic language. So we put her in a, a three-course sequence she was not happy about, and she writes this letter a year later. And she wrote, hi, Robin, I am apologized for having to send you this information at the last minute. I still need a letter. This letter should discuss my qualification, skills, and accomplishments. It should be written on letterhead and addressed to whom it may concern uh, and submitted with a recommendation form, which I will g give you tomorrow. <laughs> you see, it's much more complicated. You can also see she's learned to great vocabulary. She's learned to plagiarize probably from the application very well, <laughs> which is a genuine, no, this is a, <laughs> this is a real competence. And she incorporates it nicely into the letter. And so I do this, I write the letter, and she goes off to Washington, D.C. to do an internship, and she later on goes to graduate school. Any one of us here would be proud to have her as a daughter. Does she continue to make a few mistakes in English? Of course, and she probably always will. Academic language is not easy. Every one of us is acquiring it right now. Developing academic language, facilitating connections across grades and contents. It would have been a, a content areas. It would have been a lot easier for my student had she been in a program that really emphasized academic language and its development from the day she started school. If she went to preschool or kindergarten, when she got into second grade, I can imagine her going two plus two equal, and the instructor saying, "No, it's equals." I can imagine her. her High school teacher, you know, my vision would be she get to high school and everybody's been giving her this very consistent, very rigorous instruction. She gets to high school and then and the teacher says, you know, you really have to learn a whole lot more vocabulary. And this is what you're going to be focusing on. And as she goes through her courses, she gets vocabulary instruction, she gets grammar instruction, she gets rhetorical and um, instruction, and she's writing every day and reading very rigorous textbooks. It's not easy, but that's how st students get into Stanford and Harvard and the universities. Developing academic language is a key issue, and this is an issue about the students, because academic language is a gatekeeping situation. You will notice, you all heard, I bet you everybody in this room heard Obama speak, and his acceptance speak, how eloquent it was. Okay, this is academic language. Had he lapsed into a, you know, how you doing, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> you betcha. You betcha. We'll just. <laughs> because we stereotype language, we stereotype people on the language they use. And that's just how it is. And I don't like it. it. It is discriminatory, but that's what we do. We think that somebody who speaks slowly might be flirting or might be very dumb. And we think that somebody who speaks very quickly might be fast or might be very rude. It's all about students, giving them what they need to excel in life, to go into college or not, as they so choose. It's about academic language, that students need to reach high standards so they can get to whatever their destination may be. And everybody, everybody in the room working together to gain the expertise we need to build the bridges and not to build them nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's about managing challenges. Sometimes when you look into a crystal globe and you have to look to try to figure out what the challenges are, it's certainly for us student mobility. Um, our students are moving inside of classes and outside of classes. They're going from one school district to another school district. I work in LA Unified. Sometimes I ask the teachers how many students, how many of them have completely different classes at the end of the year. And I get a lot of hands raised because the students are moving from classroom to classroom. It's about disrupted educations and how to address the need to, to get students to identify the types of knowledge they need to continue to excel in their classroom instruction. Low level proficiency in first language and in the second makes a difference in terms of academic language. Some students have academic language in their first, you know, they, they know academic Spanish, they know academic Vietnamese, and they can read and write in those languages. And all those skills transfer into academic English, and it's easier to teach them. And then some students can't read or write. Uh, in their first languages. Uh, it's about inadequate resources. 
teachers and school students suffering because teachers don't have the books, or right now <laughs> I'm being told to lay off instructors, or we don't have Xerox machines and we're Xeroxing in our homes on these broken computer <laughs> um, Xerox machines. Uh, unqualified teachers, hey, we all suffer from unqualified teachers, and I'll just say it. <laughs> um, how rude of me, but it's true because it requires an extraordinary amount of knowledge to teach any learner effectively, and a lot more, I believe, to teach academic language, especially when you want to differentiate it to specific students in your classes, and we need to do that. It's about um, teacher turnover, because we are facing the largest tu teacher turnover in the history of the United States. It's about issues of school governance and bureaucracy and getting everybody to work together to provide students with good instruction. That's the challenge, but I'm still hopeful because I know it's doable. And I know it's doable because I've seen thousands and thousands of students coming into, because I'm teaching, that's what you didn't say, is I'm a teacher. I have 250 essays in my room. I'm going to grade them on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I know that with good instruction and attention to the details, uh, it works. We'll talk about what academic language is, the steps teachers must take to teach it, and challenges and ways to ensure that all of our students learn it. So what is it? It's an essential component of educating all students, not just English language learners, but native English speakers need it as well. It's associated with academic success and student empowerment. It brings credibility to those who have attained it. Um, and the interesting thing about academic language is not everybody in the United States needs it to be successful. And so oftentimes in an audience, someone will say, well, I know somebody who's highly, he doesn't know academic English, why do I need to teach it? And the fact is that if you are highly qualified, if you have some expertise that we need in the United States, you don't need academic language. If you, for example, if you're in computer, for, you know, you, we might, you may not have to learn academic language or if we need your academic if we need your skill in medicine that's another one sometimes you go to a doctor who doesn't speak academic language so if you have some specific skill <laughs> yeah and then if you're wealthy if you come from a we very wealthy family well then who cares if you speak academic you're already you know okay or if you have political connections <laughs> then you don't need to but if you don't and we don't want to take chances with our students. I wouldn't want to take, I, I am a mother, and I wouldn't want to take chances with my children, so why would we want to take chances with our students? It does bring credibility to those who have learned it. Uh, Lily Wong Filmer and Catherine Snow looked at what teachers need to know about language, and they looked at uh, tests. They said that students need to be able to summarize texts to do no academic language using linguistic cues to interpret and infer the writer's intentions and messages, knowing that when they read a text and it says, we should not cut down the trees, that that we refers to inclusive we. You're buying that reader into the statement, and it may be a specific company that's chopping down the trees. Not we, not me, I didn't do it. To extract meaning from the text and relate it to other ideas and information, that is to transfer it and critically think about how it applies. To analyze, it was, it should be text, sorry. Text assessing the writer's use of language for rhetorical and aesthetic purposes and to express perspective and mood. Lawyers couldn't exist well without doing that, nor can, nor can a lot of people. To evaluate evidence and arguments presented in the text and critique the logic to recognize and analyze textual conventions used in various genres for special effect, background knowledge, or for prolocutionary effect, big word, <laughs> to compose and write an extended reason text that is well developed and supported with evidence and details. Now, this is really complicated, and I wanted to share it with you because I want you to leave the room knowing that academic language is complex. In order to teach it, you really need to know a lot about language and rhetoric, the organization of language. But it's important that our teachers know this. And when teachers use, in, excuse me, when students use informal language, instead of academic language, they can suffer from linguistic discrimination. Linguistic discrimination is alive and well. Um, 
I had a student who, you know, email, we all write informal emails, and you write them ungrammatically to your friends, and I text message on my phone and think I'm really cool. <laughs> Always ungrammatically. But, as, but students, you have to understand, and I do this to like, intimate friends. I don't do this with my dean. With my dean, I construct a passage on a separate document, cut and paste it after I've read it, maybe somebody else has read it, and then I send it, knowing that you know, it might go everywhere. And if I want it to go everywhere, I write confidential on the top. <laughs> I, but students do this. They, send e they don't understand, and so they send email to instructors thinking that you know, it's innocent and it won't go far, ha ha. A student wrote uh, a dean of students and wanted to transfer into his major, it wasn't his, and he wanted um, to transfer into the major and get a job working in the lab. That professor sent the student's email across the campus and I got sent a copy and it was grammar, syntax, vocabulary, whoo! I would never hire that person and that person can't change majors. Linguistic discrimination is alive and well, but nobody will ever tell you, you know, your grammar is really bad and we're not going to give you that raise. You know, your vocabulary is really restricted and it's causing our company a lot of communication problems. I wish you could write a decent memo. Instead, what they usually do is just talk about you behind closed doors. And that's bad. That is not good. Let's look at the writing of a person who, has, uh, who had mastered academic language. What people don't realize about Abraham Lincoln is that he not only developed academic language by participating in de debates, you know, that instructional conversation, the extended language bit, which is so important, but he also memorized parts of the classics, of the Bible, and he studied rules, language rules, grammar. <laughs> he worked on vocabulary. Imagine this, you are the mother of five sons. You send them off to the Civil War, and five sons do not come home. They died in the Civil War. And so he has to write this letter to console the mother. And so he writes, I have been shown in the files of the War Department a statement of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering to you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the Republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Beautiful alliteration, nice use of synonyms for, for cohesion, beautiful uh, vocabulary, par nice parallel structures, beautiful complex clauses with relative clauses. What would have happened if Abraham Lincoln hadn't had high proficiency in the English language? You can imagine. Another president in different times. Hey, lady, too bad your kids kind of kicked the bucket. Sorry about the news. A. This, we are entering in an era of hope. <laughs> Why do we need to teach academic language? Overall, there's enormous pressure for many students and their teachers to teach it. Students have to perform well in language, particularly in literacy. And that it means that they need to master all four skill, skills. In, either, in order to read and write well, they must also learn to speak and to listen to language. So when we talk about the four skills, here they are, listening, reading, speaking, and writing. And there's different methodologies for teaching those five different skills. And so you're not confused. You may hear of these as domains and there's a new, what's the other word? We, I hear all different words. Mod modalities, yeah, modalities. Receptive skills are listening and reading, and speaking and writing are productive. What Vaughn said that she had acquired well, and she really believed it, was excellent listening and speaking skills. This is my student who sent me the letter. If you recorded her and you were to transcribe her language, you would find that her speaking is not as great as she thought it was. But certainly reading and writing are very difficult. They're among the most challenging skills, with writing being probably the most challenging and the most difficult and probably being the least well instructed in the United States. Everybody, in order to acquire reading, needs reading instruction and needs to read a lot. In order to write, you need to write a lot, but you also need to have 
great instruction. Second language acquisition for the last, I don't know, eight years has largely been ignored, I think, in terms of what second language acquisition constitutes. And there's many, many different theories. I have a, I'll just share mine. It's just so, because I like it, because it's simple <laughs> and doesn't use any complicated academic words or, or educational jargon. There is no I plus one to the 2000th. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that academic language, based on my teaching experience and some research, in order for students to learn and develop language, they need to have good instruction with student-friendly explanations. They need to have exposure to words and language, the language features you want to teach them, multiple exposures, and it has to be high-quality exposures that they understand and that they can use for language development. They have to have multiple opportunities to use the language again and again and again. And they have to have feedback so that they understand if they use the word firstable, secondable, thirdable, it's not right. It should be first of all, second of all, third of all. I had a student who thought that firstable was a word and I had a hard time convincing them otherwise. And in addition to all that, they have to be engaged with their learning. They have to be motivated, engaged with their learning. It's just that simple. And that's what we need to do with these most challenging skills. The language components of academic language. <laughs> we'll start at the top. Did you have this trouble earlier? Oh, OK. We'll start at the bottom. OK. All right. So there's discourse. Uh, which is the organization of language. There's sociolinguistics, the ability to vary language. Appro don't worry, don't take notes. We're going to talk about each one of these. The sociolinguistics, the ability to vary language appropriately according to the addressee. There's grammar, and there's vocabulary, and there's phonology. Okay, we could say other components as well. Um, I don't know any linguist who would disagree with that. I don't know any educator that would really disagree. These are components that all students need to know. They're, it's very complex to teach each one of these. And each of these components can be divided up themselves. So phonology is the sounds of the language and spelling. Vocabulary, we're going to find, is more complicated. There's everyday ordinary vocabulary, and there's more complex vocabulary. This is what all language teachers must be able to teach. All language teachers, all ELD teachers, all Spanish teachers, French teachers, German teachers, all language teachers must be able to teach these. All English teachers in high school and in middle school must be able to teach this. Anybody who's in the elementary school level um, who's teaching language must be able to teach this. All physics teachers don't need how physics teachers do not know how, bleh, do not need to be able to teach phonology. They don't have to teach all the grammar of the language. But certainly all language teachers, anybody associated with language teaching should be able to teach this. Phonology is a key p component. We often don't think about it, but there is a phonology, is a pronunciation of academic language. Think about word stress. You say ecology, echo, logical. Biology, bio, logical. Technology, technological. Morphology, morphological. And then, then think about an English learner giving a presentation who doesn't know how to use these words. Think about a native English speaker. Same thing, right? OK, we need to understand that when we're presenting academic words to students and languages, they need to know more than just vocabulary. They need to know all of it. <laughs> they need to know the stress of the words and uh, intonation, every, everything about the sounds of the English language. Another key component of phonology is spelling. Uh, we tend to stereotype people who can't spell as being stupid in the United States. And this is research. Uh, ridiculous, because if you know the research, we know that people who can't spell are usually, the research shows they're either very smart or very dumb. <laughs> it could be either. Uh, a lot of my students tell me they use spell check, and their essays look like this. <laughs> They can't rely on spell check. 
And the reason spelling, I think, is so important is because so many of our students enter into uh, the United States in the upper grades, in, say, fourth grade, and we really emphasize spelling in all of the grades, even in the early grades. And so students who come in at age eight are tremendously disadvantaged. They've lost out on a couple years of spelling. Okay, the, the vocabulary component. Um, how many words do you need to know to really understand the vocabulary on a page. You need to know about 90%. So if you're going to try to think, well, I'm going to try to use a contextual, you know, a contextual clue or, or a reading strategy of some sort to guess, you're going to just be guessing, but you might be guessing wrong. Got to teach vocabulary. Teaching vocabulary makes an enormous difference. Up. What words should we teach? It's very important. Somebody said that we can teach, an effective teacher can teach 370, what, how many words? Yeah. Like 375 words, which really isn't such a bad thing. Because those three, if, if, depending on what words they are, words tend to have large families, or they can't. Some words have large families. So if it's a word like uh, success, then the, you know, the student will learn the meaning of success, but success is also related to succeed, right? and successful and successfully. So you get two words, but you don't get two words for the price of one, what people tell me, because you have to learn the grammatical constraints in those words as in when to use success versus successful. But still, it helps. So teaching, figuring out what words to teach is really important if the child's just going to be taught 370 words in the classroom by an effective teacher when they actually need 3,000. Um, we can't assume that our students can just pick up words outside of class or through their reading because our students are on a race. Uh, they're already behind and we need to accelerate their learning. So we should teach the stu words students need to read, discuss, and write about the text they use in school. Andrew Bintmiller says, what's needed is deliberate instruction of a wide range, wide range of vocabulary in the early primary grades through oral sources, as in reading aloud to students repeatedly. Uh, most children are limited in what they can read at this age, so they're not going to read them, learn them themselves through their reading, so they need to have somebody read them to them aloud. And oral reading to students is good. Uh, I do it even at the university level. I did it, well, I come from a family of readers, and we pick up a lot of vocabulary uh, through oral reading, though that's not enough. All students require short, structured lessons focused on developing vocabulary using approaches advocated by Be uh, Beck, McKeon, and Coogan, and B. Miller. I'd also you know, recommend uh, Margarita Calderon's work. I think it's great for vocabulary instruction. I was visiting 50 classes in Los Angeles Unified School District, and I l I'd worked with the teachers for three years. And what, what most struck me is that they weren't, using, they weren't teaching academic language. And when they were, and there were just a few teachers who were, they were teaching vocabulary. It's absolutely true that we're not teaching vocabulary well, and we're not teaching it enough in our schools. It needs to be taught every day. My Korean students come to the classes, and they tell me, my classes, they tell me that they memorize dictionaries. And I couldn't believe it, and I started investigating it. And this quarter I asked um, the class, I said, how many of you have memorized a dictionary? Nobody in 20 hands go down. <laughs> and then after class in my office, I get this drive. I just want to let you know that everybody went to class. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. Academic vocabulary does it, is not easy. This is really, really hard. It's going to take sustained effort over time for students to develop it. We have to teach vocabulary to lay a foundation for academic vocabulary. Vocabulary instruction in the upper grades. Sustained, focused vocabulary instruction is necessary. Students need to learn basic words that they haven't learned, especially those words such as since that have grammatical functions. They have to know words used across content level uh, areas, all content areas. And they need to know spe content-specific words introduced in content classes. And you need to figure out where is the best place to introduce these words, teach them systematically, and review them. Basic everyday words that express relationships in time, space, quantity, direction. I just want to give you some examples. How could you take a math test without knowing those words? 
that link sentences. And then everyday words. Think of a word like live. What does it mean, live? It just means to exist, right? I live. So I write my essay. I live. Very exciting. But I could use an academic word instead. I might use the word survive. What does the word survive mean? Anybody? It doesn't mean just exist. It means to exist and With a struggle, and overcome a struggle, right. Okay. And if you write it, if you use survive, it makes your writing much more exciting. Some people would say live. Okay, my husband went to a Catholic school, and he said the nuns were lucky to survive. Now, if he were writing a paper about, you need to know my husband to know this, there was a reason behind this. And, but if he were writing a short essay about this, he could say, the nuns who taught him lived, not very exciting, or he could say the nuns survived. And the great thing about academic words that go across content areas is they tend to have big word families. So once he says survived, he can say they are survivors, and their survival is remarkable. So when students learn to write, they need to be able to write cohesively and, you know, cohesive, coming from the word cohere to stick together. And the ways you make your writing cohesive is by using pronouns such as he, she, right, to refer to a noun in the previous sentence, by using synonyms, by using, uh, trans you can use a transition word like first, second, third. Uh, you, what else can you use? You can use parallel structures, that's kind of nice. You can use me metaphors. What else? You can use demonstrative uh, adjectives like this, these, that, those. But you can use academic words. An academic word family, related parts of speech, is a much more subtle way of establishing cohesion across text. And when graders of essays read these texts that have those big word families in them, they never think, oh, this student really knows academic word, but they tend to grade higher. Why wouldn't you? It just looks much more sophisticated. And the nuns did survive. Okay, in addition to knowing those words, you need to be able to know those very content-specific words, like photosynthesis, estimation, westward expansion. And these types of words are best introduced and taught not in an English classroom, but in a content classroom. And then they need to be reviewed and practiced again and again throughout the day in ELD or ESL, you say ESL, um, or English language arts and reading instruction. One person argued with me and said, no, photosynthesis should be taught in an ESL classroom. We teach it in our, you know, in seventh grade. And I said, well, I'd like to see the book you teach it in. And it said, green, green, <laughs> the plant is green. <laughs> it's going to dilute the, the content. Okay, vocab just to show you, this is some of the t mathematics words, just, just so that you can see. They're very, you know, there's a language of math, there's a language of social studies, there's a language of English. Language of science. But academic language is not just vocabulary, and I think we're going crazy with, we are, we, we're sort of overemphasizing vocabulary and not doing a great job of teaching it in our classes, uh, just because it's what we know how to do, vocabulary. What I've seen in classroom is teachers teaching vocabulary meanings, not word use. Vocabulary meaning is very good in listening and very good in reading, but it doesn't help you as much. I mean, you have to know the meanings, but in order to write, you have to have all the features of the word. So you can't say, he discriminated in me. It just isn't right. You have to say, he discriminated against me. And how are English language learners supposed to know that? But academic language is not just vocabulary. It's especially not just wordless. Another very important component is grammar. It's knowledge that enables students to make sense and use grammatical features. Gramma grammar, it's sort of the G word. I've been calling it the G word because people don't like to talk about it. It's had a very unpopular reputation. And there's wars you should know about, you know, when should I teach it? There's no, we don't need to teach grammar. We just acquire it. 
my student didn't just acquire it. I have thousands of students who are not just acquiring it. It's probably true that some students do acquire it. Kindergartners probably do acquire it, you know, just through being read aloud to. But there are a whole lot of groups of students who absolutely require explicit grammar instruction or they're not going to learn it on their own. Grammar, I'm talking about subjects and predicates. Scooby-Doo is a dog. A subject, a sentence, a conjunction, and a sentence. Scooby-Doo is a dog and Shaggy is a human. And subjects like pronoun, I, noun, article noun, gerund, ing's, noun plus preposition combinations, noun, noun phrases uh, plus a relative clause, and much more. Grammar is not easy. It's not easy to teach, it's not easy to master, and it's highly doable. If we went back, it's highly teachable. If you went back to my student Vaughn's letter, what you would find is that she has article errors, thes and us. She's omitting them or she's putting them in places they don't belong. In the end, after a year, we've taught it to her. Well, my friends have argued, you can't teach gram gram articles, and why do you need them? You need them, <laughs> because in academic language, you just need them. Otherwise, you look at, like you're inept. Um, verb tense, key. So there's about 10 features of grammar that all students must have. Uh, there's, students need to know noun, nouns, noun plurals, count, non-count distinction. Some nouns are count, some count, uh, you can count them, and some you can't count. I'm talking to a linguist, I do this. Love, hate, abstracts, jealousy, you know, don't take an S and don't use, don't say uh with them. Um, particles too small to be counted, like sugar and sand. We don't put S endings on those. You don't say a uh, sand or hair, right? Um, minerals, liquid, it goes on and on, but it's highly teachable. Verb tense, present, past, future. Why not teach students verb tense? They need it, and they don't need to be told by their teachers, just keep to one verb tense in a page or in a paragraph. Our students are very smart. They're very capable of shifting verb tense according to the correct time frame. They need to know sentence structure. They need to know prepositions. They need to know uh, uh, the structure of a verb, uh, of a verb phrase. They need to know modal auxiliaries, can, may, will, might, m must, shall, should. There's a lot of grammar, and our students are struggling. They're struggling with passive structures because most teachers don't teach them, even in English classes, they, right? Because you know, it's not very good literary writing using passives. Once students open up a science book, they're going to find passive structures everywhere. Once they write a research paper, they might have to use a passive structure, and these are some of the typical error types they might produce. Five books were purchased by John. They might say five books were purchased without the ED ending. Conditional clauses, of course, are necessary, not only in math classes, but also science classes, in academic language. Assuming X is true, then Y. Comparative structures. If Twi is taller than Harry and Harry is taller than Miguel, then Twi must be taller than Miguel. Verb tense, a particular challenge. Modal auxiliary, it might rains tomorrow. No, it might rain tomorrow. Gerunds and infinitives. She asked him, help her, should be to help her. Students need instruction in grammar. They also know, so need to have knowledge of sociolinguistics, and this is the ability to vary your language appropriately according to the addressee. <coughs> Knowing that you say big ball, big pretty ball, big pretty green ball to a three-year-old and nobody else. An example I always give is when I lived in Mexico and I wrote my boss for a raise, and I said, querido profesor Romo, quiero más dinero. And a good friend of mine looked at my writing and said, querido profesor, is this your lover? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say estimado, esteemed? You, Robin Scarcella, are lacking in sociolinguistic competence. <laughs> the ability to vary your language appropriately according to the addressee. Our students need to be able to know how to write an email to a friend versus a dean. <laughs> they need to know an increasingly large number of genres, and I'm using that word very loosely just to mean type of writing. 
Just because you know how to write a narrative doesn't mean that you know how to write an expository. Just because you, need to, you can write an expository on one topic doesn't mean that you can write an expository on another topic. Because every time you switch topics, you might need a whole new set of vocabulary and fixed expressions, rhetorical feature, and blah, it goes on. But these are just some types of writing, and I wanted to show you how very different they are. And you can imagine the different types of language. Students can't just learn this type of writing without instruction. They need, to have, they need to have exposure to large quantities of input. They need to have practice writing. They need to have great instruction with feedback, and they need to be engaged. They also need to have discourse, knowledge of ways in which language, oral or written, is organized. So, um, So discourse refers to linguistic features that make organization salient. Uh, knowing how to do it, write an introduction using a hook. If you're referring to a story, knowing how to introduce the name of the story, the author, the publication date. Remember, academic language is all about the details. Where to put that. How to make a statement or a claim, an arguable claim, when you write your thesis, and where to put that thesis. How to build the body. How to develop the ideas using evidence how to use a quotation, introducing the uh, name of the person who makes the quotation, quoting, and then explaining the quotation, what it's all about, and, con and concluding, knowing that in most writing in the United States, you don't introduce something entirely off the topic in your conclusion. Introductory statements can all be taught to students. So those are the academic language components of academic language. Many people will tell you that there is confusion about what academic language is. It's not confusing. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> we have not defined all of the parts of that, but that's what it is. And I don't think that anybody would disagree. Uh, we might want to divide it up a little bit differently, but I don't think it's a contentious issue. It needs to be taught, and it needs to be taught systematically. It's what all language, English language development teachers must be able to teach. Reading teachers should be able to teach it. Certainly English language arts in the upper grades should be able to teach it. It's why our ESL standards, our English learner proficiency <coughs> ELD standards, will never be sufficient. And I'm not criticizing the standards, it's just that the nature of language is so complex. If you wanted to have a precise observable, measurable standard for each of the features of the language components. You'd be dealing with thousands of standards. In addition, students need to know, they have to have cognitive aspects of academic language, knowledge of the world, content-specific knowledge. If they know about photosynthesis, they're going to have a lot easier time learning about other aspects of science. Higher order thinking, study skills, learning strategies, they are in for the long haul in learning academic language. They have to be able to understand that they're going to have to do a lot of work to learn academic language, and it's going to take a lot of effort on their part and on the part of their teachers to teach it. And we have to sustain their effort over time. They need to come to class on time with a pencil in hand and know that it's a lot of work. Metalinguistic knowledge, critically important. They need to be able to step outside of their language and criticize it, critique it. When they're reading something, they need to be able to critique it. They need to look at the language features, look at that inclusive we, look at for when the author is trying to trick them or not, and look at how their own writing is, if, it's, if they need to make corrections. The dilemma. If students don't receive challenging academic instruction, they fail to acquire academic language. If they can't understand their instruction or participate in their classes, many may eventually drop out of school. The solution <laughs> is just to teach them to access challenging academic instruction and participate in their classes, not before they get to the content classes in the upper grades. It's not possible. 
How wonderful it would be if they could be truly proficient in English and not need any extra instruction once they're in the content classes. Once they get into the content classes, they're going to need a whole lot more instruction in language because it's there where they acquire a lot of content words and a lot of the grammatical features, the rhetorical features associated with that content knowledge. What they need before they get to that content class is a whole lot of foundational pieces in everyday English but and some key basic academic language. They need to know those 10 grammatical features I talked to you about earlier and a, a lot of vocabulary and discourse. They need scaffolded instruction. Okay, what's the instru problem? Instruction that is easy for language learners to understand is easy to teach and makes teachers feel good. It can help students understand the gist of concepts but not give them deep understanding of their concepts. Got the picture. This is really key. If you give play models to uh, planets and have students do that, they'll do it. They're very dutiful, but it won't teach them a lot. Simplifying language for students does not help them acquire academic literacy. <laughs> I got it. Imagine you, the students are given a passage of Jupiter, six, written at the sixth grade level. And the teacher looks out into the 30 students that she's teaching, and she knows that some of them are not going to be able to understand it. And she wants to make sure everybody understands it, so she rewrites it. What would happen if she gave them this passage? The students would acquire the language of this passage. These students, if they got a consistent, um, that kind of consistent simplified input would never be able to get into content classes. Comprehensible English input is necessary, it's just not sufficient. It won't lead to the development of academic language. Not less and lower, not less instruction and at a lower level, but more instruction so, teacher re so children reach a higher level. And this may mean from a very practical point of view that you've got to give students lessons before school, after school, in summer vacation, and be honest with students about the amount of work and effort and teachers, too, that's going to take them to acquire academic language. It may mean taking a high school student and giving that high school student an additional year. So what? That, that child would be much more prepared to go on in life. This is some steps that teachers must take. All teachers must, all teachers, all teachers must be able to teach reading comprehension, writing, and vocabulary. Science teachers, calculus teachers must be able to do this. All teachers should be able to teach to include language objectives, not just content objectives, but language objectives. And it sounds so easy, and it's what teachers are failing at miserably because they don't know how. Because for three generations, we've had teachers who haven't had much grammar instruction themselves, unless they were lucky to go to maybe a Catholic school or a Jewish school, someplace where they taught grammar. Um, Provide clear, student-friendly explanations of language. In other words, teach it. <laughs> Model language use repeatedly. Provide sufficient review and practice. Provide formative assessment, including instructional feedback. And differentiated instruction. We know that one size doesn't fit all. We know that those students who are recent arrivals in the United States are going to need survival language from the get-go. They have to be able to say fire, help, flood, <laughs> earthquake in California. Um, and we know that those students who, uh, have, who enter into our system later on or have been born in the United States need yet a different kind of instruction. And we need to be able to adapt our instruction to the needs with common sense. Needs of all students who are not making much progress improving their language, those students need English fundamentals and academic language. Obstacles. What are the obstacles? One of the key obstacles facing you right now, as in California, is the misplacement of students in the uh, incorrect programs and services. If the student's put in a content class and isn't ready, the student will fail. You've got to be able to give the, the placement exam when the student needs it. You can't rely on state data for placement exams. It's not going to work. 
student, when I give a placement exam to my students, I give it the week before class, it's based on the curriculum I use, and in the, the week of class, I retest students, all students. So they, they take essentially two placement tests to make sure they're in the right level. If they're in kindergarten, we give them an extra hour of instruction if they're struggling learners. If they're an English learner and they're not struggling, we don't, why would you give it to them? Um, in high school, in junior high school, most students, I would say all of them, even after fourth grade, they need an intensive English language program with four or five levels. There's a paucity of teachers with specialized knowledge. Look for them. <laughs> Most teachers think they know how to do academic language. They believe what it is, that they know it, but they don't. So you need to really look and hire the best teachers with a lot of knowledge of language because they're going to be teaching it to their students. They're going to be modeling it to their students. And I've seen many teachers who don't use academic language or any, <laughs> any representation of it in their classes. Um, inadequate support for teachers and students. For too long, we focused on, on testing students and we haven't supported teacher professional development. Yes, teachers absolutely do need a whole series of courses for pre-service on language and teaching English learners before they get in the classroom, but that's not enough. In addition to that, they also need to have curriculum-based teacher professional development on it, focused on academic language development. It's language proficiency. Um, inaccurate, inaccurate, uh, the inadequate curricular materials and assessments. There are good curricular programs out there. Look for them. And I'm thinking of those curricular uh, programs that support language teaching. There's a lot to teach, especially in the upper grades, and language learners have to run, absolutely run, to catch up to them. We can't be cushioning them. It keeps them behind. So we have to look at some solutions, and most of them involve good teaching. The good news is we can work together and provide English learners with a coherent curriculum addressing all of the state's standards. We can do that. We know that. The critics argue, and this is how, and it's not a popular view, but this is a time when we talk about differences in opinion. This is my opinion, and it's based on a lot of experience. For a long time, I spent my summer vacations writing curricula with, with teachers. And we'd write them and we'd use them in their classes and they wouldn't work because they were written on the fly. And then there was a time at University of California, Irvine, where I decided I would just do what I wanted with my classroom because I thought that was really fun. And I had my, because I'm a very creative person. I, mean, I, I think of myself as creative. And I love to teach creatively and do interesting things with my students. And so uh, my students were interested in romance. The women wanted to read romance novels. So I said, yeah, 50 pages a week because I'm rigorous. So they read these romance novels and they wrote stories about these. And at the end, they could write, slowly he gripped my arm, perspiration. Okay. <laughs> that they didn't know, <laughs> they, didn't, they really didn't do, do them very much good in terms of getting into their academic classes, you know? And so, but it was creative and they loved, they really liked it and hey, they were engaged. Uh, <laughs> So, and the teachers started, I, it was very embarrassing because I was the director of the program. And, and so the teachers, would, pretty soon they turned talking to me and they said, well, well, we know what we've been teaching, but what are you teaching? <laughs> <laughs> we know when our students come to us, I know that I've got, you know, I really focused on the verb, mastering the verb tense and mastering this particular group of words and this short stories and doing these types of, of um, writing. What are you doing in your class? Because I don't, when I get your students, I don't know what they know. <laughs> and so I realized that, whoa, I had to back up, and it's really time now to embrace coherent curricula that address and teach academic language that we don't write on the fly. So using a common coherent curriculum is just another bandwagon, is what I hear from a lot of teachers. There's no scientific evidence to support it. It won't work because it leads to one-size-fits-all instruction. It limits teachers' freedom. There's too many scripted tasks. It stops teachers from using their professional judgment. Most of these are not even true. The evidence suggests when teachers lack experience in teaching language, they need a common curriculum. I walked into 50 classes and I couldn't find language objectives being taught except in a handful of classes and taught just vocabulary. And when students need instructional routines, they need a common curriculum and English learners 
need instructional routines. And when students frequently move from one school to the next, they need a common curriculum. And when teachers lack proficiency in the language they teach, they need a common curriculum. The goal of teaching is not entertainment, Robbins Garcilla. The goal of teaching is instruction and learning. And the idea is to get our students into colleges, into universities, or in any employment they want in the United States. Uh, they deserve a strong curriculum. And if you can't find a strong curriculum, then the next best thing to do, I think, is to go with co common instructional strategies, which I think you should have in place anyway. We need greater emphasis on vocabulary. The inclusion of vocabulary instruction on a regular daily basis, the inclusion of scaffolded vocabulary instruction, of word use, not just word meaning. We need that to close the achievement gap. <laughs> just to overwhelm you, I did this. <laughs> this is really what you need to know about vocabulary, and probably more, but I just wanted to show you that vocabulary doesn't just consist of word meaning. There's a whole lot else you can teach students about vocabulary, and all of this does need to be taught. And we can talk more about this later if there's time. Emphasis on writing. The inclusion of writing instruction every day. As soon as kids can write, they need to be able to write every single day. Scaffolded writing, not just writing, writing, writing. This is the type of writing that improves students' writing. <laughs> Write a paragraph describing Miss Lottie in the story The Marigolds. You may want to use some of these words and expressions. I model these expressions to them. To be poorly clad. Let's hear it. Whole, you know, so the whole group. To be poorly clad. To be poorly clad. To be poorly clad. To be poorly clad. Okay, now my point is if you're going to say it once, you might as well say it again and again to include, you know, to expose students. And then as a sentence, Miss Lottie was poorly clad. How was she dressed? She was poorly clad. Okay, now this is clearly not an expression. It's a fixed expression. But, I mean, would the students be, know it? But they need to know it to write about Miss Lottie. Uh, to, to seem drawn. Her face seemed drawn. So you keep going and you, you're teaching the students you, these words. And then you allow them to write a paragraph and using some of those words. They are going to be appropriating those words, stealing them, and putting them in their writing. And I think that's really good because this appropriation is language learning. It's language instruction. Every time they write, they should be doing some of that. Students need to be taught that informal language is not the language of school or academic language. I give uh, students lots and lots of passages. This is particularly good in the upper grades. Passages that look up like this one. Um, oops, oops, oops. I want you to look at this passage. Tell me why you think it's informal. It's really pretty well written, but it's still informal. It's pretty well written. What makes it informal about it is the use of the repetition of words, the use of I think, the fact that it begins the sentence with and or but. There's nothing wrong grammatically with beginning a sentence with and or but in an informal text. It's good writing. If you want to show informality and friendliness, begin a sentence with and. I think it's good. Nice for narrative writing for some types. But this is not narrative informal writing, and I wouldn't even advise students to do this kind of narrative writing in, on a test. So it repeats the word think a lot, right? What else? I don't think. I, I, I. OK, and some, some simple sentence structures. Some kind of simple words. OK, what if he, this is? This is how I would show students to convert it into academic language. And so I give them two texts, informal and academic, and I teach them how much more academic this one is. So Jack Springer maintains that the government uh, should allow people the right to own a gun. This position asserts that. There's no I there. It's a position that asserts that. And what the author is doing is, 
putting distance between himself or herself and the reader, and that builds the person's authority. And then notice, so the argument goes, most people who own guns, so the argument goes, are responsible citizens who keep the guns for sport and recreation. It is further contended that the police are unable to stop violent crimes and we need guns to protect ourselves. However, as Josephine Bluff states, guns increase the amount of violent crime in the community. Moreover, and so the student uses, uh, the, this person uses transition words. Okay, then I'd have the students write down and compare academic language and informal language, and they do this again and again until they get the point. Now once they begin, when, they're, when they start school in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade, there's no problem with learning academic language. They're, they're happy to learn it. Once they begin to get in the upper grades, they begin to realize that their friends are not using academic language. You tend to acquire the language of those with whom you associate and they may not associate with the teacher. And so that becomes a problem, and it, it's, you really have to problematize it uh, with the students. The good thing about teaching adolescents is they're all into equity, and it motivates them to talk about equity. So it would be good to talk about e equity issues and what informal English can buy you, what academic English can buy you, who uses informal English, in which situations, and for what purpose, because informal English has a lot of very good purposes, and who uses academic language, and which presidential candidates do, and which don't. <laughs> the inclusion of instructional feedback. I did have a student who wrote firstable, secondable, and thirdable, the could have, should have ones. Um, how much better it would be just to provide instructional feedback? It's not arguable in the scientific research community that everybody believes that students require feedback. I haven't read anything that says feedback is bad, but in the discipline of English as a second language, it's highly contentious. People don't like to give feedback, and yet students need feedback. Um, I tell my students in the upper grades that errors are neither good nor bad, but perfectible. Um, I underline, ask the teachers to underline and circle errors if they're tired, <laughs> to check, use a check mark in the margin or use a symbol, like the T for verb tense, uh, over verb tense problems. Give students a global response in their use of language at the top, either you know, check plus or check or a grade, use judiciously. Do you get my point? What I'm trying to do is to give students honest feedback on how well they're acquiring academic language. And if you're giving a lot of writing assignment, it doesn't help if the teacher's just saying, good job, good job, excellent. It's much better to actually give very specific feedback on how the student can get better. And then give the student some direction on how to get better. So if the student's um, a little one, you can give them modeling and start teaching it. If the student's in the upper grade and has already been taught this again and again and again, you can give the student more instruction or ask the student to do exercises from the web, etc. cetera. Um, some people say grammar instruction doesn't work. And I tell them that it's sort of like yourself as a parent. I remember when my child was learning to make a bed. And I don't know about your kid, but I had to tell my child like 20 times and he still wouldn't make a bed. But when he came home from the university, he made his bed. I, I mean, I was really shocked. It does work. But you just have to keep doing it, doing it, and doing it until they get it. Because our goal is that we don't stop. We persevere until students have acquired academic language. And they need to know that. But, 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 it doesn't help at all. If I may, if, say I've told my child, well, you must make your bed. And my husband walked into the room and said, oh, why do you care about the bed? Don't worry about it. You know, put your clothes on the floor. Um, you have to have, provide consistent feedback across grades and content areas. And it's really helpful. If Vaughn, for example, my student, had gone into the math class and the math teacher had said, equals, you know, got the S on equals. And she went into the English class and that English teacher said, yes, you've got a, you know, you've got a subject verb agreement here. Let me help you with this. And you know, social studies, it, it's got to be consistent. And so that's why we're telling teachers in middle schools and high schools and even in the elementary schools to develop a consistent way of providing feedback and ask 
your teachers to cohere to, with it. And we have fee feedback policies on when to provide feedback and, and what kinds of feedback. Uh, in the high schools, the students now are taking their feedback um, uh, schedules to classes, so they know exactly what to expect and what a T means. When I graded in a student's essay once, I always ask my students to look at what my corrective feedback symbols mean. And he was absent the day I explained what they mean. And so he came back to class and I handed back papers and he had T all over the paper. And he said, you know, it's so nice, Dr. Scarcella, that you're praying for me. <laughs> he thought the T was like, <laughs> I had to say, you know, I will, I, I will, I wasn't, but, but <laughs> and you have a verb tense problem. Um, a great emphasis on reading comprehension. We've got word callers in our room. Kids are able to decode, but they don't understand the meanings of the words and the grammar of the reading. So they need to have instruction on reading comprehension on a regular daily basis, including reading strategies, note taking, graphic organizers, um, all of those reading strategies. Understanding that English language learners don't always have the language needed to use the reading strategy, so be careful. Uh, they need to have language analysis and discussions as a critical part of reading comprehension. So, so they, they, you model with them how to read and analyze. When I went into LA Unified just a while ago, I found that the students were doing a whole lot of oral language. I was really happy about that because in LA, kids weren't talking in the classroom. So finally they're talking. The bad news is there was no pair work. <laughs> And the other bad news was there were no language objectives, so they were just talking. <laughs> Partner sharing. So take a, take a, you know, review the doggy text that you've read, identify the main idea, take turns summarizing the doggy text, use some of these words, and you put the words into the, the mouth, so sentence stems. The main idea is, and then you give them some words to use, you practice using them, and then they partner up. We partner. Uh, in all the uh, middle school, high school, elementary school, and my university. And we find it very effective, more effective, I think, than group work because it maximizes the amount of exposure to language and practice opportunities. And it gives the teacher more control over the class. Emphasis on the development of grammar. In core instruction in the primary grades, in core instruction in the upper grades, in core instruction in ESL classes. And in the universities, teacher pre-services needed to be teaching grammar. We've watched applied linguistics program after applied linguistics program go under. We need to give a whole lot of more attention to our universities. Greater develop emphasis on the development of academic language and oral communication. So well-structured activities designed to develop students' language. I like to think about some grouping practices, ineffective and effective. The ones on the left are not so hot. <laughs> the ones on the right are very effective. So ineffective, you, take, you use unstructured cooperative learning, and you don't give any reading material. Ineffective, you, give free, you say free conversation. My son participated in lots of cooperative learning activities, and he got really, really good in them. He was really shy, so they made him the writer. So, so he, and he was really, uh, he's shy and just social into having a good time. So he got really sort of average like grades in college, but he could ace any, uh, any writing exam, any kind of vocabulary exam. So he went off to law school. <laughs> he got into UCLA <laughs> on the LSAT. <laughs> okay, effective is carefully structured cooperative learning tasks with reading materials and carefully structured conversational tasks so that you make sure that every time the students are in a group, they're actually learning language. Remember, learners tend to acquire the language of those with whom they associate. We heard this morning about the demographics. It may seem really easier teaching in an area like LA Unified where you have a, whole lot, you have a lot of English learners together. But it's not easy when those English learners are surrounded other, by other English language learners and that's who they're interacting with because they're going to be acquiring the language of the friends with whom they communicate and that language will stabilize over time. And so then you're going to be having to teach academic language and 
their particular variety of language and get them to notice the gap in between. They understand that students learn new language by correctly practicing. That's what teach, good teachers do. Practice does not make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. <coughs> correctly using language again and again leads to accuracy and fluency. Practice makes perfect, no. <laughs> practice makes permanent. <laughs> <laughs> if you practice a feature of language incorrectly, you can learn it incorrectly. And some teachers ask, well, how many times do my students have to practice the word? You know, if it's an F word, once. <laughs> <laughs> the importance of getting students to use language features is often overlooked, and especially in the instructional materials I see in the curriculum. Oftentimes, the curricular materials will give lots of activity, language activities for reading, but not for oral production and not for writing production, and it's different. Effective guided practice oral descriptions. Teachers, this is a, an easy activity that teachers can use. Uh, they can ask students to describe an object, a person, or a concept that has been described in detail in their textbooks. but give them words and expressions. This is on Confucianism in social studies. The inclusion of language objectives in core instruction and in ESL, ELD, or whether you call it ESL instruction. Instruction designed to help all learners reach particular language objectives tied to standards-based curriculum embedded materials. And I don't care whether you're using an English language proficiency standard, which I think is very good, or some other language objective that the student needs in order to access the content standard. In the primary grades, a, str a strong foundation in language required for the development of academic language, emphasis on reading, scaffolding of access uh, to access content area instruction. Certainly all newcomers require survival language, school navigational language, and by school navigational language I mean line up, <laughs> sit down, <laughs> put your books away, take out a piece of paper. In the upper grades, an intensive leveled ESL ELD curriculum for those two years and below grade level followed by mainstream core curriculum with appropriate scaffolded instructional supports. Continued emphasis on the foundation of academic language tied to content instruction in the core curriculum. When do teachers need to teach students the foundation of academic language? Each day, all classes. Timing is critical if you want students to do well on important tests. <laughs> you can't do it right before the test. You have to do it on day one of school. <laughs> Much, uh, how long it takes. Um, how long does it take the, there's a misconception that academic language takes seven to 11 years. And somebody else will say an informal language takes three years. Well, you can go to China and you can find many students who have acquired academic language and you can go to, you know, it really varies according to the students and the instructional setting. I don't know the answer to this. I know that academic language takes a long time to acquire and sustained focused effort over time to learn it with good instruction. And I know that the informal English, on the other hand, seems to be acquired early on in the United States by most students. Why do students fail to acquire academic language? Absence of exposure to books and to people who use academic language. Absence of opportunities to use the language. Absence of motivation to develop and use academic language. Absence of solid instruction, including sufficient and supportive feedback. Absence of administrators to support them in the instruction of academic language. And much of the burden really, you are the leaders. And the, the, really the department leaders, the school leaders, the department state leaders need to make sure that the instruction of academic language is going on and that you are monitoring it. And it is simply not good enough to give teacher professional development institutes. You've got to get into the classrooms to see what's going on. And the principals of the schools have to get in as well. What does the research show? All learners must have interventions just as soon as their instructional needs appear. Gaps in learning need to be addressed as soon as possible. Otherwise, students may never catch up. 
So the conclusions of this presentation, to gain academic advanced language skills, students need increased instruction. Whether, and if you want them to acquire academic language in their first language, you've got to teach it to them. Those who have a strong foundation in language, including an awareness of language use, are best prepared to develop academic language. With academic English, dreams can come true. And when you are denying students access to academic language, you are hurting, I mean, we're really undermining their futures. Remember my student, Vaughn? She went on to graduate student to school, and without academic language, it wouldn't have happened. There's a few uh, references. Doing What Works is a import very important um, website you need to know about, developed by the US Department of Education. Uh, David Francis and Mabel Rivera wrote, a, I really like these practical guidelines. I like all of them. I'm glad we have the author here <laughs> that you can discuss them. But I really tell <coughs> teachers that even though the, the one is, book one says research-based recommendations for instruction in academic, and it's excellent, excellent. Everybody should use it, whether it's for elementary and for secondary. Book two, research-based recommendations for serving ad, um, adolescent newcomers is excellent. I would recommend everybody, whether it's elementary school or uh, adolescent, use it. Do you agree? I really like this. You're not going to disagree with your... <laughs> and the accommodations, and there's more good work coming out of that center. So I think that those, those are good references. Um, thank you very much. I have some other... Let, let me take your questions on academic language, and then um, if there's more time, I do have more. And I've gotten to the point that I say, no, I don't do ESL strategies. There are other things that need to be in place before you do ESL strategies. <coughs> you give, and I know, because I've done this a hundred times, you give them the ESL strategy, but then you don't see them being implemented. And when you talk about the grammar, I mean the discourse, the, all those components, we as educators need to become very, very familiar with what they need and how, what implications they have for academic language. When you said that it was complex, I said, yes it is, but a lot of us, a lot of us I'm sure in this room, did not realize the complexity of the, of the topic of the I think you're ab I agree with you, what you said so, so very much. There needs to be support for the instruction of academic language. And I think that we haven't had that support um, for teachers, for administrators, for even State Department. Uh, and we now face this economic you know, nightmare ahead of us. But I still remain very hopeful because I think that we in the, this room understand it's important and our students. And just like you've devoted your entire life to English learners, we're going to have to go back and rethink the amount of support, and I think we've excluded the universities. The universities, of course, have to be helping our teachers, but not just giving them a single theoretical course in linguistics, but pedagogical language instruction across maybe four courses, and you know, with a second language acquisition course, a language assessment course, or two.
what kinds of things that we can do to help the State Department if they want to go this right. way. Because that's the only way that the kids are going right. to and, and now I would say that we have developed a series of videotapes, which I think are really good, where we model academic language instruction. And those videotapes, I think, are really important so that teachers can see exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And I know Margarita Calderon has a really nice model for, it's one model that's teaching academic vocabulary. And I know Mabel's work has shown us a lot of other really great strategies that can be implemented. And when they're done systematically, are, we're going to be very helpful. Um, focusing on what it is we're teaching getting teachers to understand that it's not just, can, not just content, but language associated with that content, whether it be academic or foundational. <laughs> I think that Beck's work also is very uh, Yes, Isabel yes. Beck has Isabel Beck wonderful has some wonderful, topics. and there are materials out there. Mm -hmm. So look at the materials. Uh, I find it an exciting time. Uh, Corpus Linguistics is analyzing now uh, language speech much more systematically than some of the other studies. So I'm really happy to see that happening too. Other questions or comments for Kate Lunch? Have you developed videos? Um, UC, um, UC San Diego Teacher Professional Development. Uh, we, we go out and we, I've worked for five years with middle school, high school, English learners, high point instruction. So we developed a set of videotapes for that. And then we also developed a set of videotapes where what we call it access to the core curriculum for English learners in mathematics and English language arts, middle school and high school. The Doing What Works uh, Clearing. website has little clip videos, where they, uh, they feature you, uh, that are very, very useful. I, I think they're useful. I love to see activities modeled. And, and so I think that, that that's good to do, you know, to get, make those available. And, and too, the goal is, you know, the goal is not to make money off of kids and not to make money off of education. The goal is really to teach the kids. So we ought to be making all of these materials available to everybody. And as far as I'm concerned, nobody should be marketing these. It's like your center now has, I can get everything off your center. It's all in PDF form. Yes. I have guidelines, yes, and, and uh, I've seen the word constructive feedback. You know, constructive instruction. Yes, instructional and feedback. Smiley faces and the different uh, apples and oranges or whatever they do, or stickers. That it is actual feedback that is going to make the kids be more successful. Feedback for me is so important, and it takes it, that takes a lot of my time as a teacher. I. I give a writing assignment, I take it home, I give the feedback, I give it to the student, I have a two minute conference, just two minutes with each student, just to make sure, I just check off a checklist. Then the student goes home, rewrites the paper, returns it to me, I grade the feedback. I would never ever think that a good way to grade writing would be to give feedback to the student and then expect the student to read it. You have to make sure the student actually uses the feedback to improve their writing. And then I grade that, because that to me is really important. Yes? I work with math teachers. Uh, I will tell you, I've learned so much. Thank you very much. Um, Absolutely. I, I think, yeah, with math, with math instruction, I have seen a lot of simplification. I've seen teachers avoid teaching English learners the parallel. They use this for parallel. As if the English learner is cognitively deficit. You know, they can learn the word parallel line. It's not so hard. <laughs> and I've also seen uh, this bizarre 
uh, other math language being developed by math teachers. So three murderers are upstairs and four burglars are downstairs. That's three fourths. <laughs> Right. Right. There is that belief, and I, I've seen when and th there's a lack of expertise. You really have to bring teachers around and then bring in some expertise to talk to them. Somebody has to have some expertise. Otherwise, the conversation it, you end up with what the, they'll decide what to do, and it's the least common denominator, and it's not good. <laughs> yes. Oh, so true. And so he gives them, the one of the things he started to do when his students get really mad and frustrated and they tell him, I'm a great writer, he gets that all the time. But he'll, he gives them like, here's a model of how you need to write for a presentation as an architect. And he gives them his model, and I want you to take your project and write it in this same format. And they're like, well, that's not creative. He says, I don't, at this point, want you to be creative. I want you to learn how to write in this language. And so it's not just our English language learners that are struggling with this thing. I mean, no, no. And speaking in academic and, language. And he said, I mean, these are kids with the highest scores on the ACT and everything else, but they really believe that their, their everyday language is fine in this academic Right, you've, you've got to really teach them that there's a difference between academic language and their everyday language. And it's difficult to be creative with language unless you have a very strong foundation in it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much.